take a breath before you do or say what you what you think you you should do but overall that your gut feeling is normally right G'day team, Simon here from the Feel Good Blueprint. I hope you're doing safe and well, and welcome to episode 13 of the podcast. The Feel Good Blueprint brings together a community of like-minded people to share tools, ideas, and resources to help others find their great. My next guest is Mr. Graham Gunn. He was born and raised in Edinburgh, Scotland, and after doing a gap year in his teens traveling through Europe, he returned home and fell into the whole foods industry in a rapidly growing company. His success would bring him to Nottingham, England, where he would eventually grow a beautiful family and a business. Through a rare condition, Graham would eventually need to retire prematurely and have a liver transplant in 2013. Graham would embrace his new transplant to take his health, fitness and life to a new level and was eventually selected in Team GB for the World Transplant Game Squad in Malaga, Spain. He represented GB in tennis, singles, doubles, paddle tennis and squash. He won two bronze medals and competed in all GB games since then. It was also selected in 2019 in the GB Games for the Worlds in Newcastle. In this episode, we discuss Graham's journey to following and trusting what unfolded in front of him, building a great business and team in the whole foods industry, overcoming health challenges and transmuting them into inspiring outcomes like representing Great Britain in the World Transplant Games, and how the current situation directly affects him. If anything from this episode has inspired you, I'd really appreciate a share, like, or subscribe across my platforms in any shape or form at the Feel Good Blueprint. Thanks so much. As you'll hear me talk about in this episode as well, Graham was one of the first people to warmly welcome me to the club in the Midlands and one of the last people to see me off after my season. And uh, it's just a real reflection of what a great guy he is. So thanks again for coming on, Graham, and I hope everyone enjoys this episode. Welcome to the Feel Good Blueprint. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Simon? Yeah, very good. Very good. It's a beautiful day out there. I think it's going to be a top of 20, uh, no, 30 here in London. So I'm very, very pleased about that. I'll have to get outside a bit later. Mm. Well, I think we'd all like to get outside a bit more, wouldn't we, at this particular <laughs> yeah. time? <laughs> yeah. And how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. I'm very well. Um, good news from the government yesterday or, or recently in terms of people being able to get out and about a bit more uh, and see the family, which is... Uh, yeah, it's great after quite a long time inside for most of us, I think. Yeah, it comes as a blessing and it's something I guess we'll discuss a bit later around how that affects you. But um, Gigi, I, I just wanted to uh, sort of outline to viewers and listeners, you, know, you were uh, one of the first people that I, I came a, and met with when I moved to, to Nottingham and to West Bridgeford to play my season of rugby. And, um, you know, you were, you were very instrumental in, in the club there and also one of the last people that saw me off when I finished my season there and I've got very fond memories of that and um, yeah it was, uh, it, was, it was a really good time so yeah always grateful for, for having people like you that pull that are sort of the glue I guess of, of some clubs like that. No, that's great I mean I think one of the one of my attitudes to life is you know everybody's welcome and I think rugby as a general sport uh, sport is something that embraces everybody and I think if you have people coming from far afield like yourself at that point coming from Australia I think you need to be felt to be uh, made at home and welcomed um, and I think I think that's so important and clearly I believe you really enjoyed your time at, at the club and were a great asset to us so no I think uh, it's part of the club's mentality and also uh, my mentality as a person I think. Yeah, no, it was it was really really special time. So thank you for that. Now, without further ado, um, Graham, I'd love to um, dive into a bit more about you and your sort of background. Okay, um, I'll I'll go back to my my sort of youth, if you want. Uh, I was uh, born and brought up in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, and uh, had. Uh, three sisters, uh, three siblings. Um, my father was a consultant surgeon in Edinburgh. Um, I was at school there and then when I finished school I headed up to Aberdeen University to study law um, and had a good time at university which uh, I think uh, a lot of people do. Uh, I enjoyed myself a lot and uh, for one reason or another, at the end of the second year, I decided to go on a holiday with a friend to the uh, south of France. Uh, we actually hitchhiked from Edinburgh right down to the south of France, which was an interesting uh, 
a little journey. Um, and uh, my friend had recommended this little youth hostel that I think it was about 20 people it held. So we went down there, had an amazing three weeks holiday. Um, and I was due to come back and uh, just about three days before I was due to come back, um, this chap arrived in an old Citroen van uh, who this guy owned a vineyard and said, look, we're looking for some people to pick grapes. And I sort of thought about that, so I can't do that. A couple of the other guys there said, oh, they'd like to do it. A, a Polish guy particularly, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I thought, oh, uh, I'd like to do that. The money was really good. I think I'd left Edinburgh with 50 quid in my pocket, or 50 pounds, um, and the pay was 50 pounds a week. So at that point, that was, oh, that sounds quite good. So I thought about it, uh, rang my parents and said, uh, I'm not coming back. I'm going to stay in France. Uh, I, I enjoyed university, but I didn't feel that I was really cut out to be a lawyer. Uh, it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. So I ended up uh, staying there, um, picked grapes for three or four weeks. Um, and then there was a bit of a gap where they needed someone to look after the youth hostel. Uh, there was a sort of a separate room where the person who ran the youth hostel basically um, made food, uh, kept place clean and tidy, etc. So I sort of volunteered because the previous guy um, had had to go back to wherever he came from. So I did that for about a month or so. But just going back briefly to this Polish guy, what part of... Part of the amazing experience of that for me, uh, and I think in life for a lot of people, you sometimes just have to take what's in front of you. But for this young Polish lad, I remember him saying to me that uh, he'd had to pay a very large, I don't know how much it was at the time, a very large amount of American dollars to be able to get out of Poland for a holiday. And basically the government kept that as a bond so they would go back. But uh, this was in the 70s, probably 76. Um, but what an amazing uh, guy he was, and he was with another chap, and just incredible hearing their stories from Poland at that particular point in time. And for me, having come from little old Scotland, a private school, having gone to university, what a real eye-opener for me that was. Um, so yeah, that was one of the sort of people that, uh, that I met that kind of began, I began to learn more about people, about world that I hadn't seen anything of. Um, so then uh, there was a, a Canadian guy and an Australian guy turned up uh, to do the harvest just out of the blue in an old camper van, uh, as Australians tend to do, um, converted van, I think. And uh, they said, well, look, we've finished the grape harvest here when we've done and we're going to head up and follow the grape harvest up north, as it were, through France. So I said, well, have you got room for another one? And they said, yeah, fine. So ended up basically the three of us heading up to, uh, I think we went to Dordogne, went to Bergerac, went to Champagne, uh, all the way around France basically and finished in Switzerland. Um, in fact, no, I left, I, I left them before Switzerland and ended up hitching hiking into Switzerland. But I remember arriving in Switzerland, I'd hitchhiked and it was pitch black, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, this is a different, another story actually, I just remembered this one. Um, and it was, you know, I had no idea where I was, uh, edge of the road, and there was a fence there. And I thought, well, I had a tent and sleeping bag with me, which is the way I was living, basically. Um, so I jumped over the fence and I sort of looked up and the stars were amazing, lovely, bright stars. So I thought, well, I'll pitch camp here. So I walked back about 50 yards over this fence, pitched my camp, and there was a few trees around. I thought, oh, all right. So I went to bed, woke up about six in the morning or whatever, and sort of, got out of the tent having not had a very good night's sleep and looked around and basically I looked up and I was right below the Alps and the lights yeah. that I'd seen when I'd arrived that night were lights of chalets and houses that were literally in the mountain directly above me and I'd camped in an apple orchard yeah. so that was the trees that it was that, that were there and I mean th those are the sort of things that you you have you're, you're basically thinking on your feet you're on your own what do you do so um I did some great harvest there for a bit. And then uh, I enjoyed myself so much in France, I thought right, I'm gonna head back down for the winter to the South France again, to the same little village. Um, and uh, ended up doing the oyster mussel harvest over there uh, till January, February, and then headed back to Edinburgh. 
um, having done an amazing five, six months just, uh, you know, living out my rucksack and my, uh, and, and my sleeping bag and tent, which was, it was a brilliant experience, brilliant experience. And that was sort of a way that you were able to start to develop skills of playing what was in front of you in many ways and leaning into serendipity, which is something we've discussed before. And that sort of yes. played out into your later years, didn't it? Yes, I think uh, my view on life is sometimes you have to take what's in front of you, but not everybody gets that opportunity. Um, and I think in those, at that particular time in my life, I was still learning uh, about what was there, what wasn't there. And I think a probably relatively free spirit from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But when I came back to Edinburgh, I thought, Ooh, what am I going to do now? So I immediately moved out of my parents' house. <laughs> um, um, and then got a job, uh, actually working, driving a truck in the fruit market in Edinburgh from some ungodly hour in the morning, I think three or four o'clock in the morning till about two in the afternoon, um, which was good for a while. Um, but then one day, we'd got a call from this particular store who wanted some dried figs delivered. And I'd never heard of a dried fig in my life, but uh, so I thought, and I was given this particular, a ton of figs, 110 kilo boxes of figs to deliver. So uh, I put them on the back of the truck, off I went, and arrived at this little shop in the center of Edinburgh that had no space downstairs. It was like lots of little corridors and the, the chap, uh, said to me they're going there uh, and that particular there was less than a meter squared and he wanted me to put a ton of figs in there and we had to go all the way down the stairs around the alleyway in the back and put them there so we did all that but i was told i had to get the money because we didn't know this particular client so went upstairs to the office and spoke to this uh, young lady who kind of recognized and she said ah recognize you like, oh, i recognize you turns out she was the elder sister of a guy i was at school with got talking and she basically offered me a job uh, in the shop uh, which was a whole food and health food shop mainly selling whole foods in the 70s uh, organic food very few vitamins in fact no vitamins and supplements at all um, and the money was really good because it was 29 pounds 63 a week working half nine till half five and I was earning £27 a week in the fruit market and having to get up at three in the morning. So that was great. It was a 10% increase in my salary. Mm -hmm. And I got to, got to get up a bit later. So the following week, I started my new job in the whole food shop, uh, serving customers, lifting a lot of bags and boxes of product up and down stairs. Um, and this was, I think, where my real working life began and and we'll probably come on to it later, where my working life finished within in the health food trade. So some of the work we did was ridiculously hard. We were building a business, not deliberately, but just by accident, not by design at all. Um, and we, myself and the chap who I met initially, Ian, basically served in the shop, filled bags up, served customers. We built up a mail order business, selling porridge oats and brown rice by mail order. Um, <laughs> And trucks would deliver direct to the shop with 20 tons of raisins, 20 tons of flour that we would literally manually lift up and down stairs. Uh, another funny story, if you want a, a little funny story again, another sure. one. Um, there was a bit of a standing joke. By this time, there was four of us. And we were all sort of physically worked very hard and varying in size. But there was a standing joke as to how much people could carry up two flights of stairs to put away. And there was, we would store flour and rice and all sorts of stuff up these stairs. So the record uh, at the point in time was 125 kilos, which would be uh, five bags of porridge oats on your shoulder, kind of from here all the way up, and you'd carry them up the stairs. So that was quite tricky because of the height. But uh, then this, this day particularly, there was a bunch of corn flour arrived, and they were in 50 kilo bags. So we had a bit of a challenge that, okay, we're going to, I'm going to try and get, or we're going to try and get three bags of corn flour upstairs, 150 kilos. And by, we're probably, I don't know what age I was, probably 20, 20, 21. Um, so I managed the three just with a break at the landing and got the three up. But then my colleague, Gary, another guy who's helped, who's working with us, um, got halfway up. And on the landing in the shop, 
um, there's you can there's a, like a banister, and you could view down into the shop. As he turned the corner, the top bag out of the three on his shoulder slipped off and went all the way down the banister into the shop and burst on the shop floor. Cornflour, 50 kilos everywhere. And all you could see was this cloud of dust. Um, so I currently still, I believe, hold the record of 150 kilos of cornflour up the stairs in a shop in the middle of Edinburgh in the 1970s. <laughs> it's a record to behold. Yeah, it is, it is. But yeah, from there, uh, we built the wholesale business off that, um, uh, opened a warehouse, having had our first truck delivered. So I used to work in the warehouse, ran the warehouse, drove trucks the length and breadth of the country, um, delivering to health and whole food shops, basically. Um, one day, working in the warehouse, I walked between two pallets and broke my ankle. Well, I didn't know what, but I went over my ankle with an 80 kilo bag of hazelnuts on my shoulder went down to the hospital you've broken your ankle sir we'll plaster it up plastered it up i had a little green minivan old minivan at the time um so i drove down there said we'll plaster it up plastered my uh, leg up drove back to the office sat down and said right give me something to do so i ended up phoning customers and from that point on pretty well that was my my the beginning of my time working in an office in the whole health and whole food business. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so from there, uh, I began to get into sales. Then I got into purchasing, got into buying. Uh, we then moved into a much bigger premises and delivering to customers throughout the UK and in Europe, actually, at that point. And I eventually became trading director of the business. Um, by that time, we had about 250 customers and then I was offered a job down in Nottingham where I currently live um, running a cooperative business or uh, being the assistant to the guy who was running running uh, a cooperative whole food distribution business as well so the time of life where um, your kids are young I had three kids uh, still had three kids um, at that point they were seven four and three months uh, so we decided to move down mm -hmm. uh, to Nottingham yeah. yeah, it's um, it's not notwithstanding the the lack of occupational health and safety back then, and it's uh, like notwithstanding all all the hard work that you put in and, and leading into that whole experience. And another great example of your serendipitous moment of that broken ankle turning out to be the journey into the administrative aspect, which took you to climbing the ranks and moving to to Nottingham. Um, that again, that's sort of that example that you, that you bring about sort of leaning into that serendipity and um, t t talk us through, you know, where you got to in Nottingham and, and, and then sort of onto the retirement piece. So you've, you've obviously come all the way through work, you work your way up the ranks and then you come to this retirement um, situation. Okay. Well, when we moved to Nottingham, as I said, the kids were seven, four and three months. They are now... 35, 31 and 28. So a few years have gone gone by since then. I think you played rugby actually, certainly with Callum when you were, when you were here, my youngest. Um, but uh, we moved down and uh, within, within a year of when I moved down, I was deputy to the MD at the time. Unfortunately, he had a stroke. Um, so suddenly at our financial year end and over Christmas, um, I was left holding this baby, as it were, this, this business that I'd just been brought down not long before. And the arrangement we'd had together was that uh, my predecessor worked on all the IT for the business, which he'd been building since the early 1980s, actually. Uh, and I sort of ran the business, uh, uh, looked after the staff. There was about 25 or 30 at that point in time. So suddenly overnight or within a week, I had to learn how the whole system worked. And in those days, um, uh, Everything, there were manual backups. You had to do every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year end. So I was kind of thrown into that. And again, uh, you just have to take what's in front of you and learn. So not by any plan, I ended up learning a considerable amount about IT. And going forward a few years, I used my knowledge there to decide on new packages we built onto what we already had and then a complete change. Um, so that was in 1992, um, and then business was turning over around about five, six million at that point in time. 
Um, and we, I, I built a good strong team around about me because pretty soon um, we are in Edinburgh. There was only two of us really, or three of us running running the business as a whole. I pretty soon realised this was going to be a much bigger business down here, and I needed support from people who hopefully were going to be of a like mind. You don't really know that until you bring them in. Um, but there was a couple of guys who were there already, who one of them particularly, who's still in the business now, and he's now been there for 30, 32 years. I just spotted him, he was in the warehouse, he was picking orders, and I just saw something of me in him. The guy was 18 years old or thereabouts. Um, so I saw him and eventually, uh, not long, uh, probably seven, eight years after I arrived, I promoted him into buying. So he moved from the warehouse into buying, etc. And now I believe he's still purchasing director in the business now. So I think it's important that uh, if you see some, something of yourself, but also you see someone who has drive and passion, you should give them the opportunity to show what they can do. Uh, as it, it the same in a rugby club, I think you've got young people who you need to give the opportunity to show what they can do, with you know with guidance if they need it. And the person has needs to be a certain kind of person, I suppose. Maybe I'm that character as well. Um, so then, uh, unfortunately, uh, in 1997, I was diagnosed with a, a liver issue uh, called autoimmune hepatitis, um, which didn't affect my work at all at the time. But um, I was only diagnosed because my wife, Jill, who's been an amazing support for me, said, I don't look very well. I should uh, go to see the doctor. I said, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. Bloke thing, nah, I'll be all right. Anyway, eventually two weeks later, I was becoming a little bit yellow. Uh, go to the doctor. Okay, yes, boss, I'll go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so he went and said, you need to go into hospital straight away. So I went into hospital, blood tests, and basically told them my liver was in a was not doing very well, but it was going to be manageable with medication. So basically my immune system was attacking my liver. So from 1997, 1998, uh, I was on uh, immunosuppression that helped uh, suppress my immune system to stop it attacking my liver. Um, so that's... That, uh, that medication then sort of kept things under control. I was still working flat out, doing silly hours, probably seven days a week. Um, and then uh, I think there were lots of challenges for me at that point in business, but some amazing achievements that due to medication, I was still, the, the liver had no effect on me. I think the first one was we moved our warehouse uh, from a 30,000 square foot warehouse to a 90,000 square foot warehouse within a week with a service level being exactly the same in the new premises it was when we left the old premises, customers hardly saw any change. 10,000 products at that point, 105 staff and about 400 customers spread throughout Europe and the world, uh, the world really. Um, that was a, for me a great uh, achievement. And the other achievement was we rebranded the business from its original name to a much more modern name, Modern Outlook modern logo, uh, modern ethics, um, professional, approachable and ethical. That was our three um, watchwords that I felt reflected the business and the people with, around me in the team believed that was good three words to use uh, as our vision for the business. Um, and then it got close to 2010. Um, the business by this point was turning over about 24 million. And uh, I begin to, the, uh, my medication had, I had to up the medication to control the immune system on my liver. And by this time, uh, I was on virtually a top dose and my liver was beginning to fail. So eventually I retired end of 2011 through ill health, um, which was sad for me, but 35 years odd in the industry, having pretty well achieved a hell of a lot more than I'd thought when I was wandering around a, a, a vineyard in the south of France picking grapes in 1976, <laughs> earning 50 pounds a week, um, was something I, I, I'll never regret and uh, was, was great for me, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a great story because it was a, obviously an early retirement too. So what was it like, I suppose, um, facing 
that um, that finishing line and sort of knowing what you'd achieved? Um, I was very sad. Uh, I'll remember when I announced I was going to retire. Um, the day I, the week before I left, because I, I left early, um, we'd agreed a date, but I felt it was time for me to go. Uh, I read out this letter to, I couldn't possibly say it off by heart, to the staff in the canteen. Uh, and none of them knew what was going to happen, but they, they knew I wasn't 100%. And that was an incredibly emotional time for me where I explained what was happening, why, who was taking over from me, guy I'd put in place about three years before. So if I got run down by a, run down by a bus, there was a, there was a, a replacement plan in, in, in place um, for me. Um, and then the day I left, I got all sorts of gifts from the staff and everything else. And I actually still have it now, but I got a retirement card from the staff. And every single one of 105 staff had signed that card. And that for me was amazing. You know, normally you get the odd card here and there for all sorts of things. But, uh, and I absolutely hold on to that card as one of the, the finest things that I, I you know, I, I love it because it, 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 uh, it made me feel really good that I, they obviously felt that I treated them well, hopefully. And I gather now there's still over 50% of them are still working in the business now. So clearly um, they're committed to the business as, as I was. Um, so yeah, that was late 2011. Um, after that, um, myself and uh, my wife took a bit of time out. Uh, my daughter at that point was living in Australia, uh, near your home territory in Brisbane. Mm. She'd been there for a few years. So we took some time out, went to visit her for a while. Um, but then as it got to late 2012, um, my liver was beginning to really begin to pack up. And I remember Jill and I sitting down with the consultant and he said, look, Graham, um, we've got a problem here. Uh, medication is not going to sort this. Now you're going to have to have a transplant. And uh, I'd never, well, I remember early, early doors in the late 90s, my consultant had said, look, you'll be fine for 16, 17, 18 years. You never know. I've got people on medication longer than that. Um, but this was it, obviously. So you go through, um, I mean, hopefully there'll be some people who, who are listening to this, maybe who understand a bit about it, but you go through all sorts of medical tests and checks. Uh, the operation happened in Cambridge, uh, but my local hospital in Nottingham here, I was there for three days. I was in Cambridge for a week, having all sorts of tests on my diet, on my family support, on my physical ability, uh, my lungs, my heart, all, all like a full body MOT and the rest. Um, and from that, they, they get to see, you know, whether you're a likely candidate, a good candidate for a transplant should the right uh, organ come along. And of course, a liver mainly in those days, and this is seven years ago, seven and a half years ago now, mainly would be from a deceased donor. Uh, whereas a kidney, you you can survive with one, and you know you, people can donate kidneys. Um, so that was obviously really tough for us to think about. Um, but I went through all that. Um, I was still I, I was playing a lot of tennis. Um, not I had played squash for many years before, but I wasn't really doing much squash, but a little bit. Um, so I was keeping myself in as good shape as I could be, but I was, I'd play tennis, come back and fall asleep within 20 minutes just mm -hmm. because my liver wasn't very, very good. So I finally signed a document um, towards the end of March 2013. And I was so lucky that within 10 days, I got a phone call saying, we think we've got a match, Mr. Gunn. So uh, went down to Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, about a couple of hours away. And then uh, 36 hours later, um, I was out of operating theatre and having had a transplant. Uh, unfortunately, I think the, well, there was some sort of problem during the operation, so they had to stop kind of halfway through, um, which I think was incredibly upsetting for Jill, but uh, there had been a problem with my kidneys and various other things, I believe. So basically, I was put in induced coma for two days, which I don't remember much about. Wow. And they 
the first operation was about 13 hours, I think. And then the second one, two days later, was about eight hours. And then I was in intensive care for three or four days on a ventilator, which we'll all know about these days. Um, and then I think gradually I came out of it about six, seven days after the operation. Um, and then pretty quickly after that, I was able to get up and about a bit. And um, yeah, so that was a, a big thing for me, really big thing. Really big thing. And um, I think it was actually, I'd come to the club only um, a matter of a couple of years after this had happened to you. And I just recall, you know, you, you were you're really active and, and, and very much full of energy. Um, how, how did the, the post transplant, how did that change things for you? Um, I think it, it, two things, I think mentally, uh, mentally, socially and physically, three things. So mentally, um, it's quite a, they do uh, quite a lot of psychological stuff before the transplant because mentally it can be quite tough depending on your, your view on things and that some amazing family has donated their loved one's uh, organ um, to you. And I'd advocate anybody to make sure they don't opt out in the UK of transplant. And if you're in another country, do get your name on the donor register because I would not be here now had I not had uh, the donor family donate their loved ones uh, liver for me. And are, are you able to, to speak with them or is there any contact to, to sort of speak with them or have that contact and thank them or whatever it be? There's a process where you write to your um, transplant coordinating team uh, as an open letter um, and they then contact the family and ask if they want to hear from the, uh, uh, the person who's had the transplant. Um, but in my case, the family um, don't or didn't the last time I wrote want to want to communicate, which is fine. Um, but they can. I think it might be two years or when the transplant team feel it's right. But again, it's up to the uh, the donor family to make mm -hmm. that decision. Mm -hmm. um, so I was relatively active before my transplant. In fact, the day before myself. And my wife Jill played a doubles tennis match on the Saturday afternoon, um, but uh, I wasn't 100. percent But you know, that's I was trying to keep myself in shape as much as possible. Mm. Um, and then, so mentally, I think that's uh, that was tough. Physically, uh, moving on to that, um, about four or five months after uh, my transplant, um, knowing Jill, knew, knowing my wife, knowing that I wanted to get in some sort of decent shape, having had your stomach sort of cut open <laughs> bluntly. Um, she'd spotted these leaflets in the hospital in Cambridge for something called the British Transplant Games, which is basically um, various games take place for people who've had transplants of any kind, heart, lung, liver, pancreas, bone marrow, all sorts of things. So she said, why don't you have a go at that? And I went, no, 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 not good enough to do that and all the rest of it. So, um, she, then she persuaded me said I'll go on then so I contacted the people and said yeah yeah we'd love to have you on board so there was two or three training camps and then the games took place my transplant was in May 13 first games I went in took place in July 14 so I what am I going to do oh well, I'll do tennis that's fine um, I thought well I can maybe do squash right um, racket sports I'll do badminton as well why not oh I'll mm -hmm. go to table tennis so you're allowed to do five sports so I did uh, four sports table tennis squash badminton and uh, tennis so took part in that I played three games of squash before the competition because I hadn't played any squash at all since I was 23 by this time I was 56 so uh, did that I ended up getting a bronze medal in the squash which surprised me Amazing. So I thought, well, I could, I could do this. Um, so I came back with that. I got a bronze in the tennis and that was, I think that was the size of it. But I, that was absolutely, it was physically an incredible experience. Um, socially and mentally in terms of building you back up from where you've been having had a transplant. You're competing and socialising with people who've been through exactly what you've been through. And the ambience, camaraderie, stories to tell is unbelievable it's absolutely unbelievable and i'll never forget the first games i i played you know it's very competitive which is great mm -hmm. but also it's it's very sociable um and i do think that um you know i've made some friends 
through those games that will be with me for life. Um, you know, so much so actually, uh, I don't know if you, there's a, um, at the moment there's this 25 press ups for 25 days challenge going on around about. So um, one of my younger um, fellow transplantees, Chris Cliff nominated me, um, he plays squash as well, tw 19 days ago, I've just done on my 19th day today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll show you how well we get on. Uh, he's just 40 today. Is that uh, one of our fellow squash players asked us to do a short video for him on his birthday? Everybody who's involved in the transplant games with Chris. So we've all done a short video, and his wife handed in the video or showed him the video today of a short clip from all the other 12 people in the squash team, and he's absolutely blown away by it. Mm. And that, that's the sort of ambience you create. Um, and then, um, I didn't realize, but then there's something called the World Transplant Games that happens every two years. So after British Games, they told me about this. And I think if you get a medal, then they say, would you like to be part of the Team GB? We'll have some training camps. We'll assess whether we think, you know, you can get Britain a medal, as it were, mm. but also, again, to have the international experience. And the financial issues as well, you know, so it, it can be, it is relatively expensive. But I also knew that the first year of the transplant games I went into was my 60th birthday at the same time I was going to be at those games if I got into the team. So that was in 2017. I was selected in Team GB and the games happened in Malaga. So I was selected for squash tennis and paddle tennis, which is a mix of squash and tennis played in Spain mainly. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, again, an amazing experience. 19 members of my family and connected family came out because it was my 60th at the same time. My daughter designed a t-shirt for us um, for wearing around socially that um, had um, Gunny on the front because I'm, I'm not known as GG, like you said, it's Gunny. And on the back, hashtag guns on tour. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was great. And the t-shirt I've got on here um, is um, Transplant Games, uh, World Transplant Games t-shirt. I thought I'd show, just wear that to show it to yeah. you. Yeah, for anyone listening in, um, Graham's wearing uh, the Team GB shirt from the exact um, games we're just discussing now, which is just yeah. it's still looking crisp and fresh and proud as punch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's an incredible achievement to come from what you, know, what you went through to, to a very short time, literally you know, representing um, Great Britain at the Games. Well, there must have been such a, a great way to get you back on your feet, especially sort of mentally, emotionally, all that kind of thing. Yes. Um, and I think, uh, as I think the third thing there I mentioned early on is socially is, mm. uh, and you get to know people so well. Uh, I'll remember um, in the quarterfinal of the squash in Malaga, I was playing this, God, he must have been six foot seven Bulgarian guy. Um, and I'm whatever, five foot nine, five foot ten. Um, big, big lad, um, and uh, didn't speak a word of English. His coach didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak, obviously, a word of Bulgarian. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of sign language as to what, you know, what, what, how are we going to play this? What sort of point structure going to be and everything else? But fundamentally, I, I won, which was great. And we just gave each other a massive hug, you know, as if to say, well done, and all the rest of it. So that was it. Uh, and it's just sort of guy you won't miss because he's so big. So... Four days later, when the tennis competition, singles tennis competition started, who was the person that I met in the first round of the tennis was my big Bulgarian friend. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I said, hey, how are you doing? Great, great big sort of hug again. And uh, that, that, that's the sort of ambience um, and the social environment that's created in these games. So I've got a whole connected group of guys and, and women who I've met now socially after having the transplant. And I think that that's the other thing that's probably changed my life uh, and made me a whole group of friends that I hadn't expected to have mm. uh, in principle. And so from there, I've, I've now been, until lockdown, uh, I play squash three times a week in a local club. Um, I play tennis three or four times a week and just started again about two weeks ago. Um, and I have a gym session once a week uh, at the moment because there's no tennis or squash, no real tennis or squash. Mm. I'm doing my gym session in the garden every morning on my own. <laughs> yeah, but, like many but based on, Yeah, but based on my good friend, um, 
Yusuf Patterson Mosapir, who works with CrossFit, um, who was taking my sessions uh, every Friday morning. He's a great friend of mine, great friend of my youngest son, and I've known him since I was five. So he's put the sessions together for me, and they're, they're brilliant. They're brilliant. He's a wonderful man. He was our second guest on the Fugal Blueprint. We had a podcast from him thinking about and helping people uh, do their workouts from home. You know, obviously you've known him for many years, but he's helped you adapt. That. I think we're talking about this, your, your home workout too. But yes. um, you, you've mentioned the lockdown and how that's affected and changed things for you. It's even added a, a degree of complexity, I believe, to, to how you approach your days and, and your weeks. Can you run us through how that's affected you? Yes. I mean, uh, I would normally have gone out tw twice a day, three times a day, play tennis. I'm very involved with the Westbridge Rugby Club, as you said. I'd be going down doing some voluntary work on the ground or dealing with the administration around about that. But once lockdown happened or uh, we were given advice by our uh, consultants that we should uh, lock down very early. Um, so... I actually locked down from the 8th of March with my wife, Jill, shielding me here, working for the university remotely, whereas most people locked down for about the 23rd. Mm -hmm. So I was fundamentally didn't go out of, the, of my house or garden for pretty well 12 weeks. Um, and nobody came into the house until probably the last week my son went round the back of the house into the garden and we were well socially distanced. Um, so that was quite hard. I think it was very hard for Jill um, initially because she would be used to going out to work, driving to work, meeting other people, whereas here she's shielding me. So fundamentally she can't go places where I can't go, otherwise she might bring it home. So yes, it's been quite tough. I think for me, and I, you hear it probably elsewhere within lockdown, um, it's good to get yourself a routine. Um, and getting up at the same time as Jill, having breakfast together, she goes to work, I'll do a bit of work on the PC, and then I'll go out and do my session. And my sessions are getting harder and harder, as I said to you early on before we started. Mm -hmm. Today's was very hard because it's about 27 degrees and no wind. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, halfway through up today I thought oh, I'm not going to finish this but I sort of pushed myself really hard so so that's that's the sort of first thing of my day and then I'll normally go outside again do something after that we have lunch together so it's all about a routine um, but in the last two to three weeks we the tennis club opened up so we've been playing tennis together um, with our own balls not touching anything um, etc etc I'm not going to be able to play squash for a long time, I suspect, because of the close contact uh, and the, the droplets and all the rest of it. Because basically with the level of immunosuppressants I'm on, I'm very, very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Even although I'm relatively fit, I'm very vulnerable to uh, COVID-19. Um, unlike, not everybody, but a good number of people who have transplants, um, once you've had a transplant, as time goes on, most people can reduce their immunosuppressants by a certain amount. Because my immune system, as I said early on, which is what happened with my liver, because my immune system is still there and still trying to deal with this liver, um, I have to be on a higher level of immunosuppressants than most people who've had transplants. So I am very vulnerable. So neither of us have been inside any other building other than our house since the 8th of March. Um, because of the risk of close contact with people. But we have been out playing tennis, we've been out for cycles, we've been out for walks, where outside the risk is very minimal for us. Um, but for me, this is about common sense and physically and mentally what you feel you can deal with. But I do think there are some people, I'm very lucky, uh, people say this all the time on the, on the news that uh, I have a garden, um, and you see some people, you know, who've got a young family, who've got a flat. I mean, I think that's very mentally challenging. But again, my recommendation, get yourself into a routine so that you know every day roughly what you're going to do and you don't sit down and just switch the telly on and watch daytime telly. Uh, it's being creative. Um, and I think all the online sports that have been happening is great. Uh, and I think as everybody says, I think a lot of people are a lot fitter now than they were before lockdown. 
Um, so I miss, I miss, I think the thing I miss most, and I'm sure it's the same with everybody, but I probably will have to a certain extent, is the, the physical contact and the social contact with, with people. Um, the close social contact and rugby club going forward, I'm going to have to be incredibly careful there. Um, once that starts opening up, which hopefully it will do at some point uh, this year. Um, tennis again, uh, I intend to start playing tennis doubles sometime in the next two to three weeks once I feel confident about things. Um, so it is challenging. Um, yeah. And I think you've done really well to um, put it all in perspective, you know, knowing you, I think, and the things you, you're, you're faced with, you've been able to pull out a lot of positives of it. I mean, we, when we were talking before we were recording, you, you said something that really um, struck a chord with me is like, you know, you don't know when you might be able to walk into the rugby club with you, which, which you've, there's so many years of, of being in there and you've been so involved in the community, not knowing when you could walk into that building even, it's just a really confronting thing, putting myself in your shoes. So I think, you know, you, you've done incredibly well to put it in perspective, given what you've got at the moment. Yes, I, I, I do think, like everything in life, and maybe it's the view on, on life, you, you look at what's in front of you and sometimes you just have to grab it. Uh, and if there's a negative situation, which clearly there is for everybody at the moment, uh, not just me, um, you have to be realistic about it, but you have to work work around what works for you at that particular point in time. Um, so if rugby does start, clearly in a building will be, I'll have to be very careful, but out with a building even, I'll need to make sure I stay relatively far away from people. If I am going to go inside, I'm going to have to wear face coverings, which I think a lot of people will. Um, if I'm going to touch anything, I've got to make sure I've got my hand sanitizer with me, which I have or my gloves, um, but you have to make the most of it. Um, and I think um, socialising will be very important to me, I think, because of that, but it's going to have to be remote socialising. My, my youngest son lives here with his, uh, with his wife, um, and I can't, like everybody else, technically I can't cuddle them because they're in a separate, you know, give them a big hug because they're in a separate household from us. Uh, and that, that's quite challenging and rightly so they are paranoid they don't want to even consider giving it to me if they've got the virus um, but you know like everybody we've got uh, a garden with a fence that's been painted a number of times since lockdown <laughs> um, and the grass is looking incredible um, but again you know what do we do for holidays do I want to go on a plane not sure possibly um, do we want to get up back up to Scotland to our home country once it opens up? Absolutely, definitely want to plan a plan a trip to the west coast in a camper van or whatever it seems seems right for for the two of us. So we'll we'll find ways through things. You have to, otherwise, you might as well just sit in your room here and do nothing at all. Yeah, I've heard some really amazing stories from all round through the news and social media and people like yourself about overcoming these things and. I think it is for a lot of people it can be quite a, a deeper emotional thing because yeah, everyone's got their own story. And I guess what this is, a, this is really about is, 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 is uncovering some of these, these stories of the millions of people that you just, you, you don't know what they're going through. And, and I suppose that I, ho I hope that this brings together more closeness as much as we can't have that physical closeness at the moment that the people are coming together and really, uh, supporting each other is even if it's an online community but being there for other people that's one of the common threads I've I've seen yes I think that's right and I think also there's the um, the, the, the 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 fact at the moment that because there's no obvious solution on the horizon for most people um, they can deal with that uh, in the, if they get it a lot of people will be absolutely fine. They say a much larger percentage of the population have had it than have been tested or that people think have had it. Uh, in my situation, and as with everybody who's potentially going under, under cancer treatment or all the vulnerable, the two million people, the vulnerable people um, in the country, um, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. and, and it ever until there is a vaccine, unless we've already had it. And if we get antibodies, then that's great. Um, I haven't been tested yet. I think relatively soon they may be able to get uh, tests for the vulnerable people to see if they have had it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but that doesn't that's not to say as everybody knows you, you're not going to get it again so basically as a transplantee we stick to the government guidelines guidelines they are uh, not regulations uh, for us and you you you're intelligent about what you do and what you think you can do um so i see now as i've said that squash i'd love to go and train on a squash court but i'd have to be absolutely confident that the squash club had absolutely cleaned the squash court down before i went on it mm -hmm. if i'm going on my own because mm -hmm. playing squash with another person is high going to be very difficult for me Mm -hmm. um, but tennis, tennis will be able to work around. So, mm -hmm. again, you just have to find workarounds for these things. Yeah, and and Graham, is from from your experience and what you've gone through, is there anything in particular that um, you you impart or try and encourage in other people with their lifestyle and health to help them? Yes, I I, I think a balanced diet. <laughs> um, learn how to cook mm -hmm. for goodness sake learn how to cook um my 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 all, all my kids can cook and they actually take pride in it now my mother was an amazing cook but for years i didn't do much cooking once i was working ridiculously hard i did beforehand my passion for whole foods probably taught me a little bit about wanting to to to, to cook i'll just think about what's in the cupboard and chuck it together and see what it tastes like but i think it's also for me that's a little bit of an escape as well 4 30 in the afternoon get into the kitchen create something and see what it's like um and i think that's a a very important thing for for, for people to learn um so eating the right food i think um being f open and honest with people you meet uh, and making making sure that they they understand that you are so that I'm not saying you say this is the way it's got to be for me but you 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 get them you let them understand that you what you're saying is is from the heart all the time and you're not trying to go behind people's back you're not trying to um, I suppose maybe this comes from the as i told you about the three visions for the business maybe this comes from the ethical and moral bit that you know i think you should treat people the way you would like to be treated yourself mm -hmm. and i think that's something that i've i've held on to probably for most of my life because probably that comes i assume from your parents and you know my father was a, a classic example of of someone who was incredibly humble but incredibly successful um, and I think you from your early days you learn um, you learn how to treat people you treat people fairly they will treat you fairly um, very good advice yeah. very good advice mm -hmm. and um, one more from me uh, to wrap up uh, it's a question around um, what do you think the world needs a bit less of at the moment Ooh. Mm -hmm. um, I think blame culture. I think we need to get rid of blame culture. Um, people need to, the flip side of that is, the flip side of that, sorry, is the, see the flip side of that is, is working together mm -hmm. um, rather than working against each other. Mm -hmm. So get rid of blame culture, work together, um and i think as i said before treat people the way you would want to be treated yourself in all environments whether it be in a social environment whether it be in a competitive environment on the rugby pitch you know if you uh, there are things you can do on the rugby pitch that you shouldn't do and if someone did it to you don't do it to somebody else but if someone tackles you hard you tackle them hard but I, so I, I think in every situation, if you put that into the way you're dealing with things, take a breath before you do or say what you what you think you you should do. But over all that, your gut feeling is normally right. All round great advice, Mr. Graham Gunn. All round great guy and champion. Thank you so much for your time today. There you have my episode with Graham Gunn. I hope you got out of it as much as I did. Now, if you have any feedback, comments, want to jump on the podcast or have any ideas, 
you're welcome to contact me at thefeelgoodblueprint at gmail.com. Thanks, everyone.